Scene one, chapter six of No Name. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. No Name by Wilkie Collins. First scene, chapter six. I hope Miss Vanston knows her part, whispered Mrs. Marrable, anxiously addressing herself to Miss Garth in a corner of the theatre. If airs and graces make an actress, ma'am, Magdalen's performance will astonish us all. With that reply, Miss Garth took out her work and seated herself on guard in the centre of the pit. The manager perched himself, book in hand, on a stool close in front of the stage. He was an active little man, of a sweet and cheerful temper, and he gave the signal to begin with as patient an interest in the proceedings as if they had caused him no trouble in the past and promised him no difficulty in the future. The two characters which opened the comedy of the rivals, Fag and the coachman, appeared on the scene, looked many sizes too tall for their canvas background, which represented a street in Bath, exhibited the customary inability to manage their own arms, legs, and voices, went out severally at the wrong exits, and expressed their perfect approval of results so far by laughing heartily behind the scenes. "'Silence, gentlemen, if you please!' remonstrated the cheerful manager. "'As loud as you like on the stage, but the audience mustn't hear you off it. Miss Merrill ready? Miss Vanston ready? Easy there with the street and bath. It's going up crooked. Face this way, Miss Marrable. Full face, if you please. Miss Vanston?' He checked himself suddenly. "'Curious,' he said, under his breath. "'She fronts the audience of her own accord.' Lucy opened the scene in these words. "'Indeed, ma'am, I traversed half the town in search of it. I don't believe there's a circulating library in Bath I haven't been at.' The manager started in his chair. "'My heart alive! She speaks out without telling.' The dialogue went on. Lucy produced the novels from Miss Lydia Languish's private reading from under her cloak. The manager rose excitedly to his feet. Marvellous! No hurry with the books, no dropping them. She looked at the titles before she announced them to her mistress. She sat down Humphrey Clinker on The Tears of Sensibility, with a smart little smack which pointed the antithesis. One moment, and she announced Julia's visit. Another, and she dropped the brisk waiting-maid's curtsy. A third, and she was off the stage, on the side set down for her in the book. The manager wheeled round on his stool and looked hard at Miss Garth. "'I beg your pardon, ma'am,' he said. "'Miss Marrable told me, before we began, that this was the young lady's first attempt. It can't be, surely.' "'It is,' replied Miss Garth, reflecting the manager's look of amazement on her own face. Was it possible that Magdalen's unintelligible industry in the study of her part really sprang from a serious interest in her occupation, an interest which implied a natural fitness for it? The rehearsal went on. The stout lady with the wig and the excellent heart personated the sentimental Julia from an inveterately tragic point of view, and used her handkerchief distractedly in the first scene. The spinster relative felt Mrs. Malaprop's mistake in language so seriously, and took such extraordinary pains with her blunders, that they sounded more like exercises in elocution than anything else. The unhappy lad, who led the forlorn hope of the company in the person of Sir Anthony Absolute, expressed the age and irascibility of his character by tottering incessantly at the knees and thumping the stage perpetually with his stick. Slowly and clumsily, with constant interruptions and interminable mistakes, the first act dragged on, until Lucy appeared again to end it in soliloquy, with a confession of her assumed simplicity and the praise of her own cunning. Here the stage artifice of the situation presented difficulties which Magdalen had not encountered in the first scene, and here her total want of experience led her into more than one palpable mistake. The stage manager, with an eagerness which he had not shown in the case of any other member of the company, interfered immediately and set her right. At one point she was to pause and take a turn on the stage. She did it. At another she was to stop, toss her head, and look pertly at the audience. She did it. When she took out the paper to read the list of the presents she had received, could she give it a tap with her finger? Yes. And lead off with a little laugh? Yes, after twice trying. Could she read the different items with a sly look at the end of each sentence, straight at the pit? Yes, straight at the pit, and as sly as you please. 
The manager's cheerful face beamed with approval. He tucked the play under his arm and clapped his hands gaily. The gentlemen, clustered together behind the scenes, followed his example. The ladies looked at each other with dawning doubts whether they had not better have left the new recruit in the retirement of private life. Too deeply absorbed in the business of the stage to heed any of them, Magdalen asked leave to repeat the soliloquy, and make quite sure of her own improvement. She went all through it again, without a mistake this time, from beginning to end, the manager celebrating her attention to his directions by an outburst of professional approbation, which escaped him in spite of himself. "'She can take a hint!' cried the little man, with a hearty smack of his hand on the prompt-book. "'She's a born actress, if ever there was one yet.' "'I hope not,' said Miss Garth to herself, taking up the work which had dropped into her lap, and looking down at it in some perplexity. Her worst apprehension of results in connection with the theatrical enterprise had foreboded levity of conduct with some of the gentlemen. She had not bargained for this. Magdalen, in the capacity of a thoughtless girl, was comparatively easy to deal with. Magdalen, in the character of a born actress, threatened serious future difficulties. The rehearsal proceeded. Lucy returned to the stage for her scenes in the second act, the last in which she appears, with Sir Lucius and Fag. Here again Magdalen's inexperience betrayed itself, and here once more her resolution in attacking and conquering her own mistakes astonished everybody. "'Bravo!' cried the gentleman behind the scenes, as she steadily trampled down one blunder after another. "'Ridiculous!' said the ladies, with such a small part as hers. "'Heaven forgive me!' thought Miss Garth, coming round unwillingly to the general opinion. "'I almost wish we were papists, and I had a convent to put her in to-morrow.' One of Mr. Marrable's servants entered the theatre as that desperate aspiration escaped the governess. She instantly sent the man behind the scene with a message. "'Miss Venston has done her part in the rehearsal. Request her to come here and sit by me.' The servant returned with a polite apology. "'Miss Venston's kind love, and she begs to be excused. She's prompting Mr. Clare.' She prompted him to such purpose that he actually got through his part. The performances of the other gentlemen were obtrusively imbecile. Frank was just one degree better. He was modestly incapable, and he gained by comparison. "'Thanks to Miss Vanston,' observed the manager, who had heard the prompting. She pulled him through. We shall be flat enough at night when the drop falls on the second act, and the audience have seen the last of her. It's a thousand pities she hasn't got a better part. "'It's a thousand mercies she has no more to do than she has.' muttered Miss Garth, overhearing him. "'As things are, the people can't well turn her head with applause. She's out of the play in the second act. That's one comfort.' No well-regulated mind ever draws its inferences in a hurry. Miss Garth's mind was well-regulated. Therefore, logically speaking, Miss Garth ought to have been superior to the weakness of rushing at conclusions. She had committed that error, nevertheless, under present circumstances. In plainer terms, the consoling reflection which had just occurred to her assumed that the play had by this time survived all its disasters, and entered on its long-deferred career of success. The play had done nothing of the sort. Miss Fortune and the Marable family had not parted company yet. When the rehearsal was over, nobody observed that the stout lady with the wig privately withdrew herself from the company, and when she was afterward missed from the table of refreshments, which Mr. Marable's hospitality kept ready spread in a room near the theatre, nobody imagined that there was any serious reason for her absence. It was not till the ladies and gentlemen assembled for the next rehearsal that the true state of the case was impressed on the minds of the company. At the appointed hour no Julia appeared. In her stead Mrs. Marrable portentously approached the stage with an open letter in her hand. She was naturally a lady of the mildest good breeding. She was mistress of every bland conventionality in the English language, but disasters and dramatic influences combined threw even this harmless matron off her balance at last. For the first time in her life Mrs. Marrable indulged in vehement gesture and used strong language. She handed the letter sternly, at arm's length, to her daughter. "'My dear,' she said, with an aspect of awful composure, "'we are under a curse.' Before the amazed dramatic company could petition for an explanation, she turned and left the room. The manager's professional eye followed her out respectfully. He looked as if he approved of the exit, from a theatrical point of view. 
What new misfortune had befallen the play? The last and worst of all misfortunes had assailed it. The stout lady had resigned her part. Not maliciously. Her heart, which had been in the right place throughout, remained inflexibly in the right place still. Her explanation of the circumstances proved this, if nothing else did. The letter began with a statement. She had overheard, at the last rehearsal, quite unintentionally, personal remarks of which she was the subject. They might, or might not, have had reference to her hair and her figure. She would not distress Mrs. Marrable by repeating them. Neither would she mention names, because it was foreign to her nature to make bad worse. The only course at all consistent with her own self-respect was to resign her part. She enclosed it, accordingly, to Mrs. Marrable, with many apologies for her presumption in undertaking a youthful character at what the gentleman was pleased to term her age, and with what two ladies were rude enough to characterize as her disadvantages of hair and figure. A younger and more attractive representative of Julia would no doubt be easily found. In the meantime, all persons concerned had her full forgiveness, to which she would only beg leave to add her best and kindest wishes for the success of the play. In four nights more the play was to be performed. If ever any human enterprise stood in need of good wishes to help it, that enterprise was unquestionably the theatrical entertainment at Evergreen Lodge. One armchair was allowed on the stage, and into that armchair Miss Marrable sank, preparatory to a fit of hysterics. Magdalen stepped forward at the first convulsion, snatched the letter from Miss Marrable's hand, and stopped the threatened catastrophe. "'She is an ugly, bald-headed, malicious, middle-aged wretch,' said Magdalen, tearing the letter into fragments and tossing them over the heads of the company. "'But I can tell her one thing. She shan't spoil the play. I'll act Julia.' "'Bravo!' cried the chorus of gentlemen, the anonymous gentleman who had helped to do the mischief, otherwise Mr. Francis Clare, loudest of all. "'If you want the truth, I don't shrink from owning it,' continued Magdalen. "'I'm one of the ladies she means. I said she had a head like a mob and a waist like a bolster. So she has.' "'I'm the other lady,' added the spinster relative. "'But I only said she was too stout for the part.' "'I'm the gentleman,' chimed in Frank stimulated by the force of example. I said nothing. I only agreed with the ladies. Here Miss Garth seized her opportunity, and addressed the stage loudly from the pit. "'Stop! Stop!' she said. "'You can't settle the difficulty that way. If Magdalen plays Julia, who's to play Lucy?' Miss Marrable sank back in the armchair, and gave way to the second convulsion. "'Stuff and nonsense!' cried Magdalen. "'The thing's simple enough.' I'll act Julia and Lucy both together. The manager was consulted on the spot. Suppressing Lucy's first entrance, and turning the short dialogue about the novels into a soliloquy for Lydia Languish, appeared to be the only changes of importance necessary to the accomplishment of Magdalen's project. Lucy's two telling scenes at the end of the first and second acts were sufficiently removed from the scenes in which Julia appeared to give time for the necessary transformations in dress. Even Miss Garth, though she tried hard to find them, could put no fresh obstacles in the way. The question was settled in five minutes, and the rehearsal went on, Magdalen learning Julia's stage situations with a book in her hand, and announcing afterward, on the journey home, that she proposed sitting up all night to study the new part. Frank, thereupon, expressed his fears that she would have no time left to help him through his theatrical difficulties. She tapped him on the shoulder coquettishly with her part. "'You foolish fellow! How am I to do without you? You're Julia's jealous lover. You're always making Julia cry. Come to-night, and make me cry at tea-time. You haven't got a venomous old woman in a wig to act with now. It's my heart you to break, and of course I shall teach you how to do it.' The four days' interval passed busily in perpetual rehearsals, public and private. The night of performance arrived. The guests assembled. The great dramatic experiment stood on its trial. Magdalen had made the most of her opportunities. She had learned all that the manager could teach her in the time. Miss Garth left her when the overture began, sitting apart in a corner behind the scenes, serious and silent, with her smelling bottle in one hand and her book in the other, resolutely training herself for the coming ordeal, to the very last. The play began, with all the proper accompaniments of a theatrical performance in private life 
with a crowded audience, an African temperature, a bursting of heated lamp-glasses, and a difficulty in drawing up the curtain. Fag and the coachman, who opened the scene, took leave of their memories as soon as they stepped on the stage, left half their dialogue unspoken, came to a dead pause, were audibly entreated by the invisible manager to come off, and went off accordingly, in every respect sadder and wiser men than when they went on. The next scene disclosed Miss Marrable as Lydia Languish, gracefully seated, very pretty, beautifully dressed, accurately mistress of the smallest words in her part, possessed, in short, of every personal resource, except her voice. The ladies admired, the gentlemen applauded. Nobody heard anything but the words, "'Speak up, miss!' whispered by the same voice which had already entreated Fag and the coachman to come off. A responsive titter rose among the younger spectators, checked immediately by magnanimous applause. The temperature of the audience was rising to blood-heat, but the national sense of fair play was not boiled out of them yet. In the midst of the demonstration, Magdalen quietly made her first entrance as Julia. She was dressed very plainly in dark colours, and wore her own hair. All stage adjuncts and alterations, excepting the slightest possible touch of rouge on her cheeks, having been kept in reserve to disguise her the more effectually in her second part. The grace and simplicity of her costume, the steady self-possession with which she looked out over the eager rows of faces before her, raised a low hum of approval and expectation. She spoke, after suppressing a momentary tremor, with a quiet distinctness of utterance which reached all ears, and which at once confirmed the favourable impression that her appearance had produced. The one member of the audience who looked at her and listened to her coldly was her elder sister. Before the actress of the evening had been five minutes on the stage, Nora detected, to her own indescribable astonishment, that Magdalen had audaciously individualized the feeble amiability of Julia's character by seizing no less a person than herself as the model to act it by. She saw all her own little formal peculiarities of manner and movement unblushingly reproduced, and even the very tone of her voice so accurately mimicked from time to time that the accents startled her as if she was speaking herself with an echo on the stage. The effect of this cool appropriation of Nora's identity to theatrical purposes on the audience, who only saw results, asserted itself in a storm of applause on Magdalen's exit. She had won two incontestable triumphs in her first scene. By a dexterous piece of mimicry she had made a living reality of one of the most insipid characters in the English drama, and she had roused to enthusiasm an audience of two hundred exiles from the blessings of ventilation all simmering together in their own animal heat. Under the circumstances, where is the actress by profession who could have done much more? But the event of the evening was still to come. Magdalen's disguised reappearance at the end of the act in the character of Lucy, with false hair and false eyebrows, with a bright red complexion and patches on her cheeks, with the gayest colours flaunting in her dress, and the shrillest vivacity of voice and manner, fairly staggered the audience. They looked down at their programmes, in which the representative of Lucy figured under an assumed name, looked up again at the stage, penetrated the disguise, and vented their astonishment in another round of applause, louder and heartier even than the last. Nora herself could not deny, this time, that the tribute of approbation had been well deserved. There, forcing its way steadily through all the faults of inexperience, there, plainly visible to the dullest of the spectators, was the rare faculty of dramatic impersonation expressing itself in every look and action of this girl of eighteen, who now stood on a stage for the first time in her life. Failing in many minor requisites of the double task which she had undertaken, she succeeded in the one important necessity of keeping the main distinctions of the two characters thoroughly apart. Everybody felt that the difficulty lay here, everybody saw the difficulty conquered, Everybody echoed the manager's enthusiasm at rehearsal, which had hailed her as a born actress. When the drop scene descended for the first time, Magdalen had concentrated in herself the whole interest and attraction of the play. The audience politely applauded Miss Marrable, as became the guests assembled in her father's house, and good-humouredly encouraged the remainder of the company to help them through a task for which they were all, more or less, palpably unfit. But, as the play proceeded, 
nothing roused them to any genuine expression of interest when Magdalen was absent from the scene. There was no disguising it. Miss Marrable and her bosom friends had been all hopelessly cast in the shade by the new recruit whom they had summoned to assist them, in the capacity of forlorn hope. And this on Miss Marrable's own birthday, and this in her father's house, and this after the unutterable sacrifices of six weeks past. Of all the domestic disasters which the thankless theatrical enterprise had inflicted on the Marable family, the crowning misfortune was now consummated by Magdalen's success. Leaving Mr. Vanston and Nora on the conclusion of the play, among the guests in the supper-room, Miss Garth went behind the scenes, ostensibly anxious to see if she could be of any use, really bent on ascertaining whether Magdalen's head had been turned by the triumphs of the evening. It would not have surprised Miss Garth if she had discovered her pupil in the act of making terms with the manager for her forthcoming appearance in a public theatre. As events really turned out, she found Magdalen on the stage, receiving, with gracious smiles, a card which the manager presented to her with a professional bow. Noticing Miss Garth's mute look of inquiry, the civil little man hastened to explain that the card was his own and that he was merely asking the favour of Miss Vanston's recommendation at any future opportunity. "'This is not the last time the young lady will be concerned in private theatricals. I'll answer for it,' said the manager. "'And if a superintendent is wanted on the next occasion, she has kindly promised to say a good word for me. I am always to be heard of, Miss, at that address.' Saying those words, he bowed again, and discreetly disappeared. Vague suspicions beset the mind of Miss Garth and urged her to insist on looking at the cart. No more harmless morsel of pasteboard was ever passed from one hand to another. The cart contained nothing but the manager's name, and under it the name and address of a theatrical agent in London. "'It is not worth the trouble of keeping,' said Miss Garth. Magdalen caught her hand before she could throw the cart away, possessed herself of it the next instant, and put it in her pocket. "'I promised to recommend him,' she said. And that's one reason for keeping his card. If it does nothing else, it will remind me of the happiest evening of my life, and that's another. Come, she cried, throwing her arms round Miss Garth with a feverish gaiety. Congratulate me on my success. I will congratulate you when you have got over it, said Miss Garth. In half an hour more Magdalen had changed her dress, had joined the guests, and had soared into an atmosphere of congratulation high above the reach of any controlling influence that Miss Garth could exercise. Frank, dilatory in all his proceedings, was the last of the dramatic company who left the precincts of the stage. He made no attempt to join Magdalen in the supper-room, but he was ready in the hall with her cloak when the carriages were called and the party broke up. "'Oh, Frank,' she said, looking round at him as he put the cloak on her shoulders, "'I am so sorry it's all over.' Come to-morrow morning, and let's talk about it by ourselves. "'In the shrubbery at ten? asked Frank, in a whisper. She drew up the hood of her cloak, and nodded to him gaily. Miss Garth, standing near, noticed the looks that passed between them, though the disturbance made by the parting guests prevented her from hearing the words. There was a soft, underlying tenderness in Magdalen's assumed gaiety of manner. There was a sudden thoughtfulness in her face a confidential readiness in her hand, as she took Frank's arm and went out to the carriage. What did it mean? Had her passing interest in him as a stage pupil treacherously sown the seeds of any deeper interest in him as a man? Had the idle theatrical scheme, now that it was all over, graver results to answer for than a mischievous waste of time? The lines on Miss Garth's face deepened and hardened. She stood lost among the fluttering crowd around her. Nora's warning words, addressed to Mrs. Vanston in the garden, recurred to her memory, and now, for the first time, the idea dawned on her that Nora had seen the consequences in their true light. End of chapter 6 from the first scene